natin sa ikalawang araw ng pandaigdigang komperensya sa nanganganib na wika dito po sa National Museum of Natural History. Sa araw na ito ay nasa hapag natin ng mga paglalapit ng mga karanasan mula sa mga nagtataguyod. ASEAN Bansa tulad ng Thailand. Simulan na natin ang ikalawang araw para sa pagpapakilala ng ating plenaryong tagapanayam at mga tagapanayam sa sesyong panel. Narito si Commissioner Abdon Balde Jr., kinatawan ng wikang Bicol. Good morning. Magandang umaga po sa amin sa Bicol ay makahari na aldaw sa Indogabos. Uh, good morning to our guests, uh, our speaker, invited uh, speakers, our participants. Uh, a very pleasant good morning to all of you. Before I proceed, I have a sad story to tell. It is a very sad story and it happened in a village very near our town yesterday. Yesterday, a young and beautiful teacher, aged 23 and mother of two, was stabbed to death 21 times and killed. It happened in the town of Pudoran, and the teacher was sleeping inside the school because her home is far away, about 44 kilometers away from school. And the school was almost inaccessible except by motorcycle. You have to walk a few kilometers before you can reach the place. The young teacher was allowed to sleep in school because she had nowhere else to sleep. Uh, what is very sad about it was the suspect that they caught yesterday was also a minor, 17 years old, and also a student, but of a different school. Uh, why did I tell you this story? I tell you this story because uh, now that we are implementing mother tongue-based education, it is sad that this is not being implemented properly because we do not implement localization. We have been advocating for localization that school teachers should preferably teach in their own town, in their own locality, in their own community. Because there are a lot of advantages. First, the teacher need not have to learn the language or the dialect of the school she or he is teaching, which is very far away from his home, from her home. So, if she is teaching in her own community, the teacher and the students will have one and the same mother tongue. Number two, the teacher is familiar with the culture and the history of the place. So he is expert in his own area. And she has somehow built his or her own reputation in the area. Number three, she will not be exposed to the elements to the dangers of long travel, and she could economize on her food and on her subsistence. If she is teaching also in her own community, she is almost home-based because she can go home for meals and he could be immediately at home to take care of the children after school. This is the reason why we have been trying to advocate 
localization in our, even in our province. I don't know in your province uh, if you're advocating it. So because of what happened yesterday, there is a poem I have written about teachers that I want to read for you this morning. It's written in Filipino, Ang Maestra. Narito na naman sa eskwalahang kasintanda yata ng sangsinukuban, sa luma na kwartong kalinga ng araw, ng hanging habagat at anggi ng ulan. Nagsisiksikan sa masikip na kwarto, mga estudyanteng nangangarap matuto. Tipid na sa gamit, hiram pa ang libro, lagalag ang isip, bakante ang ulo. Ang hamak na classroom ay sira ang sahig, kisa may may mapa, pintoy di may pinid. Pilay na ang mesa, blackboard ay limahid, kahit walang lindol ang silya ay tagilid. Ang textbook na luma pinagtitiyagaan, mga kamali ay nireremedyohan. Ingat sa pagawa ng bawat lesson plan, dapat ay maayos ang pag-aaralan. Layon ang leksyon maipaliwanag sa simpleng pagtuturo at pagpapahayag. Mga bata na may natututo agad kapag ang tinuturo matuwid at tumpak. Itong pagtuturo'y laking sakripisyo, sa araw at gabi tuloy ang trabaho. Tambak ang gawain, karampot ang sweldo, walang katapusang pag-aasikaso. Ang pagiging maestra kung iisip-isipin, profesyong kay daming hirap at pasanin, bago o masenso kay daming tungkulin at pananagutang dapat natiisin. Pagmasdan ang buhay ng hamak na maestra na may asikasong bahay at pamilya. Kay habang lesson plan, tatapusin muna kahit napapagod at inaantok na. Kay agang gigising, magluluto muna ng almusal para sa kanyang pamilya. Linis ng bakuran, linis ng kubeta, saka maglalaba at mamamalansa. Nakikiagawan, makaupo sa jeep, may bit-bit na baon, may kip-kip na gamit. Sa biyahe, ang leksyon, ang laman ng isip, hindi alintana ang ulan o init. Subalit ang pagod parang naiibsan kapag natututo itong kabataan. Kay sarap isiping pamanang iiwan sa estudyante ang binhing karunungan. Kay laking orgulyo ang dulot sa maestra pag ang estudyante ay nadidisiplina, batang may magandang asal sa eskwela, sa katawat isip malusog, masaya. Sulit na puhunan ang pagsasakripisyo pag may estudyante na umaasenso. Ang pasasalamat, pakitang respeto sa maestrang naghirap ay sapat ng premyo. Salamat po. Ngayon, balik sa trabaho. Uh, I will first introduce the uh, speaker and then I will introduce the panelists afterwards. Now, ang plenaryong tagapanayam, mag-umpisa po tayo doon. Siya ay associate professor ng wikang Hawaiian at araling Hawaiian sa kahaka, ula o Kai Lekolani, Philippine College of Hawaiian Language, University of Hawaii sa Hilo. Madalas ilarawan na lolo ng pampasigla ng wikang Hawaiian sa modernong Hawaii ang kanyang mga saliksik ay nauugat, nag, nauugat sa pagkakabuo ng mga pangunahing programang edukasyonal noong 1980s na nagbubunsod sa muling pagkabuhay ng wikang Hawaiian. Nag-ukol siya ng dalawampung taon sa paglikha ng audio documentation ng natitirang mga katutubong nagsasalita ng wikang Hawaiian, isang mahalagang koneksyon sa modernong mga nagsasalita nito. Tumulong din si Kimura 
nakasalukuyang naglilingkod bilang tagapangulo ng Hawaiian Lexicon Committee sa paglikha ng mga salitang Hawaiian. Siya ay nakapagtatag ng Aha Punana Leo Hawaiian Medium School noong 1980s na nagpasimuno sa pagbabalik ng wikang Hawaiian sa mga tahanan sa pamamagitan ng mga batang nasa edad tatlo at apat at patuloy itong ginagawa hanggang ngayon. Kasabay nito, instrumental siya sa pagtatatag ng U.S. Hilo Halis Cuomo Hawaiian Language Center. Isang sentro na kanyang ipinanukala bilang testimonya sa Native Hawaiian Study Commission, isang komisyon na nilikha ng Kongreso noong 1980 upang magsagawa ng pag-aaral sa kultura, mga pangangailangan at sularanin ng katutubong Hawaiian. Malugod ko pong ipinakikilala si Ginoong Larry Kimura. Please stand. Please go, please. Okay. You can now sit down again. I will call you later on. <laughs> now for the panelists. The first panelist, tagapanayam ng panel, ay isang professor ng linguistika, sociolinguistika, bilingualismo, edukasyong intercultural at pananaliksik sa PUCE. Siya ay may PhD sa linguistika, mga pag-aaral na doktoral sa sociolinguistika at contact linguistics. May MS siya sa Cultural Anthropology, university, isang programa para sa, hi, sa higit na mataas na kalipikasyon sa mga metodolohiya sa ling, etnolinguistika at pagtuturo ng French at BA sa linguistika mula sa Pontifica Katolika de Ecuador. Siya ay naging visiting professor sa maraming universidad sa Europa at Hilagang Amerika at pinagkalooban ng Gawad Ford Foundation, Pamahalaang French, McNamara Foundation, Oregon State of Higher Education, Ministry ng Kultura sa Ecuador at iba pa. Noong 2004, taong 2004, tinanggap niya ang Fulbright Visiting Scholar Award at noong 2004, Labing anim naman ay tinanggap niya ang U.S. Ambassador's Research Grant upang magtrabaho sa mga proyektong muling pagpapasigla. Noong taong 2017 ay kinilala siya bilang Researcher of Excellence. Sa loob ng sampung, huling sampung taon ay nakabuo siya ng mga proyektong interdisciplinaryong Batay sa pamayanan at malawak na dokumentasyon muling pagpapasigla, muling pagpapasigla ng mga wikang katutubong Ecuadorian. Siya po ay walang iba kundi si Dr. Marlene Habud. Ang susunod na tagapanayam, ay taga Southeast Asia. Simula pa noong isang libo siyam na raan, siyam na put lima ay naglilingkod na siya bilang mananaliksik at lecturer sa Research Institute for Languages and Cultures of Asia sa Mahidol University. Kasama siya sa dokumentasyon ng pagpapasigla at pangangalaga ng nanganganib na mga wika at gayon din sa bilingual na edukasyon para sa mga pangkating etniko sa Thailand. Ang kaniyang espesyalisasyon ay pagpapaunlad at pagpapasigla at pangangalaga sa mga pangkating etniko at etnolinguistiko. Natamo niya ang kanyang MA at PhD sa linguistika sa Mahidol University. Pinakikilala ko po, I'm uh, proud to introduce Ms. May Mayori Thawernpat. Okay. 
the next panelist, when I saw him, I suspected that he came from the clan of uh, swashbuckling movie stars, Douglas Fairbanks and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. <laughs> Siya ay Associate Professor sa Department of American Indian Studies sa University of Minnesota na siyang Director ng Programa para sa Wikang Ujibwe. Ujibwe. Pinangangasawa niya ang paglikha ng bagong degree program na BA in Ujibwe at nagtuturo sa ikatlo at ikaapat na taong kursong Wikang Ujibwe. Nagsasagawa din siya ng pananaliksik sa maraming aspekto ng wikang Ujibwe sa pag-asang makakakuha ng mga bagong konsepto sa kanyang mga estudyante. Lumahok siya sa komunidad sa pamamagitan ng pagbibigay ng gabay sa mga immersion teacher at nagtuturo ng konseptong panggramatika sa isang lokal na programang immersion na tinatawag na uh, This is a real tongue twister Ojibwe Mutaa Didaa Umaa Gikakii Minaang Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brendan Fairbanks Brendan, please Okay now, may I call on Professor Larry Kimura for the uh, lecture. Thank you. Hi, aloha nui kakou apau e nga kana ka akokoa ma ke ia aha no ka nana ana i ke ola pono ka kakou o lelo o iwi o ka aina mahalo nui ke ia kono ana meia Thank you very much for having me at this uh, conference for Endangered International uh, Endangered International Languages uh, I have to remember, um, in Hawaii, of course, we have one language, but here you have over 130, and other parts of the world have many, many languages that we are all conscious about. So it's become, a, of course, a world concern. And we are all part of the world, so we would like to all address this uh, singular issue. So thank you for having this conference. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was um, told by one of your commissioners here that I could be a Filipino. So I said, well, I guess because uh, to make a Filipino, you need Japanese and you need Hawaiian. And then you will have Filipino. So, <laughs> but of course, I think we are related, uh, not only because we are in this big ocean here, Pacific Ocean, but also we are part of the Austronesian uh, language family, uh, not only our languages, but of course our connections to our genealogy over a long period of time. But time is of essence, so I shall proceed with my presentation. As you see the um, topic here, and uh, shall I turn this? Because every time I look this way, I might get off the mic. Oh, it is oh you have a wireless, okay. Yeah, because I can't memorize everything I put onto, the, onto my PowerPoint. So I don't have it up here. But I could use the wireless. And um, so as it says, indigenous language, medium, and philosophy of education. This is the... Um, the import of the documentation and resource development from a Hawaiian experience. So I have to say that uh, I am not a linguist, 
I was, I was not trained as a linguist, so uh, I explained uh, to the organizers here of the conference that I will be talking from our experience in Hawaii only, and I know that what we are doing in Hawaii is also very relatable to many situations throughout the world, although there are different considerations, different factors, wherever you may be in your own places, and it's not all the same. I, um, so, I would like to, uh, is this working? Or you could move my slide for me, thank you. Uh, talk about uh, documentation in Hawaii. In, uh, I guess, four general areas here, and that would be uh, documenting. I, uh, I presume we all kind of have a general idea of documenting, recording our languages. However, they are first recorded and continue to be recorded and documented. So documentation for us in Hawaii was done very early on, and I'm sure throughout the world, without uh, reclamation in mind, because we were all healthy at one time. And then, of course, documentation to preserve for future scholars. And, of course, um, record it. I would like to say maybe linguists were in that category where uh, they were pres um, I shouldn't say that. I won't. I'll take that back. Uh, that's a bad thing to say. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, record it for language revitalization. And that doesn't mean that it was actually used. So the next category in Hawaii, lots of um, products. For, as a result of revitalization, up to this point in history, of course, it continues on. but. Uh, products of language revitalization, in other words, uh, utilizing documentation in our experience as it's proceeding now for over 30 years since uh, I will use the date of uh, 18, uh, excuse me, 1983 as sort of the beginning of uh, Hawaiian language revitalization. Uh, and I'll get into that date a little bit more. So these are the kinds of areas that we are experiencing the use of documentation and how documentation has become very important to us in the progress of revitalizing the Hawaiian language. Shall I use this button again? I'll try. Oh, let me, oh, it does work. Okay, here we go. And so some of these um, images you see here, the Mamaka Kayao, for example, is a new words uh, dictionary. Uh, the, the lady in the middle there is Mrs. Mary Pukuipu. Mary Pukui, who is the co-author of our currently, our current most used Hawaiian dictionary, along uh, she, along with Sam Albert, a uh, linguist, uh, compiled this uh, beautiful dictionary and was published in 1957. Of course, the Kumuhonua Mauliola with the fish hook there is the documentation of our Hawaiian uh, philosophy, Hawaiian philosophy for education. So, uh, as I said in our, the topic here in Hawaii, the revitalization is occurring by utilizing the very institution that was quite uh, instrumental in its demise because, uh, as we all know, uh, education system is very powerful and that's what we're using, the power of, uh, of uh, current uh, technology as we all use it. Uh, for whatever purposes, so we're using the power of organized education for bringing back our language. Uh, of course, down there, that was me when my hair was a little bit blacker and uh, darker, and uh, interviewing a, one of our kupuna, or elders. Uh, most of our native speakers, of course, in Hawaii have passed on. That was in 1960, um, excuse me, yeah, 1975. And uh, so what we have left today are less than 30 native speakers in, of Hawaiian today, and most of them, of course, are very, very old. And then, of course, uh, that image below there is, the, is the, uh, an example of the uh, uh, early uh, printing that occurred at one of our early missionary schools, Lahaina Luna, and, it, they, and that building, the print house is still standing and it, that newspaper um, shows the main uh, feature of our documentation in Hawaii through publication of Hawaiian language newspapers from, 19, uh, from 1834 
all the way to 1948, so over 100 years of Hawaiian language documentation to what I call very cheap publishing because newspaper print uh, is cheap. And um, that's one of the reasons we are very concerned in preserving, and the best way to preserve it today is through, uh, is through uh, uh, digitizing, because we do it and have it available by just pressing our little finger on it, and we access all the Hawaiian language newspapers. So, oh. now it doesn't go, so do I go this, oh, I press it backwards and then it goes. Oh, are you helping me? <laughs> okay, so. Um, just so a bit of history, and everybody has their history and very similar, I understand. So basically, um, first contact uh, was with our uh, great captain James Cook, came in 1778 from England and exploring the Northwest Passage, and uh, later um, met his demise right in Hawaii at Kealakekua Bay in 1779, over some misunderstanding on, uh, on the very valuable item of metal. And then, of course, our great uh, king, Kamehameha, who set up his dynasty, or his monarchy, and that set up the whole uh, government system in Hawaii, which is the kingdom, or monarchy. And uh, other, uh, of course, uh, Significant individuals were our Hawaii uh, the American missionaries that came from the American uh, mission uh, from Boston, Massachusetts, arriving in Hawaii one year, just one year after the death of the great King Kamehameha, and um, the country was in uh, turmoil and uh, was convenient for the um, establishment of the Christian. Uh, philosophy or uh, religion throughout the uh, Hawaiian Islands. The major thing that, uh, of course, the missionaries brought with them was the, the in great intent to uh, spread the word of God. And the way they knew how to do that was to translate their Bible into Hawaiian. And in order, in order to do that, they had to set up a alphabet. <clears throat> the American missionaries were a bit um, not so great in learning languages, but they did get assistance from a London missionary uh, uh, missionary uh, society from, from the London Missionary Society, and he was uh, stationed in the, um, on the island of Tahiti, and he came to Hawaii to assist uh, the American missionaries. And uh, of course, Tahiti and Polynesians all the way down to New Zealand, to Rapa Nui, the Polynesian Triangle as we know it today. That vast area is one language family. So it was quite easy for, um, for the, uh, the language to be assisted by the experience of what was already happening in uh, Tahiti as we know it today as French Polynesia. So French has taken over that part of, the, of Polynesia. So um, everybody, um, the Philippines, Hawaii, we all have our history. And uh, of course, the main thing here is that when Kamehameha and our kingdom was established from, as I have there, 1779 all the way to 1893, the main language of operation, especially of government, was through the language of Hawaiian. Uh, and then, of course, in 1893, uh, uh, the Kingdom of Hawaii, independent country of Hawaii, was overthrown by American business interests. And this is where we have uh, further connections to the Philippines because, like my uh, Japanese side, uh, they all came to Hawaii to seek uh, employment because we were starting the sugar industry in Hawaii that went on for 100 years. So of course, many, many immigrants came from different countries, not only Philippines and Japan, Portugal, Puerto Rico, uh, China, all over. And this is what makes up Hawaii today, a mixture of many races, 
but at the foundation, of course, of our indigenous identity is still Hawaiian. Oh, that's the backwards. I have to face it this way. Okay, there we go. Oh, okay. Huh? Oh, it's the video. Okay. No, oh, this one. Oh, sorry. Am I operating this or are you? Uh, oh, I am with this. All right, so uh, pala pala is the word that naturally uh, we had many, many, uh, the world was upon Hawaii uh, from, well, even probably possibly before Captain Cook's uh, discovery, so, so to speak. But um, as soon as the missionaries came in 1820, starting this alphabet, and the alphabet looked somewhat like you see here on our traditional uh, tapa cloth or paper mulberry cloth that we produce as our clothing. And on the clothing, we would do designing, and the designing is called palapala. So writing appeared to be like palapala. So that's the word we use for literacy, writing, reading. Um, and as this quote says, as you can see, this is from an 1888 report from, at that time, the Department of Instruction in the Kingdom of Hawaii. And the report is um, saying about how palapala, or literacy, had spread from the beginning, and how interesting the spread uh, was spread quickly and affected a mass of people. So the report says the high chiefs, with their immediate attendants, were the first pupils. Of course, the chiefs would have said, you teach us first, then you teach the citizens later. We want to learn about this. And then uh, each chief sent the most proficient scholars of his, in his retinue to his different lands as teachers, with notice to his tenants to attend school. Uh, the eagerness of the people to acquire the novel wonderful arts of reading and writing was intense and almost the whole population of both sexes, all ages, went to school. And that's the report, 1888. Um, now, the question is, consideration, of course, is what made our people so interested in something that was on a piece of paper in those days? Um, and I, it's not recorded. I can only um, think that at the arrival of these ships to Hawaii, our people saw, you know, pieces of paper like this, which is very similar to our paper mulberry cloth. And on it, some scribblings. And they saw how it was being handled and being very curious about what was occurring saw the effect of something like this being passed between two individuals, person looking at it like this, and some kind of a action or outcome. That's my only guess. From early on, before the missionaries even came there, they knew about this magical thing. Another um, consideration is the connection of the people the masses throughout the eight major islands of Hawaii and their leadership. At that time, as I said, we had a kingdom and the king, uh, Kamehameha, had died just a year before the arrival, but his two sons who were inheriting the uh, monarchy at the time that he had set up with, first son was a bit young, so Kamehameha's favorite wife, Kaahumanu, became the uh, premier, she, uh, the Kuhina uh, Nui, and uh, began to help her two sons work their way as they got older into the positions that they had inherited. Anyway, um, they all, the leadership, were very much in touch with their people. And that's another reason I think uh, the masses, the citizenry throughout the islands we're also very aware that our leadership is getting involved with this piece of paper and that's black and white stuff on it. And it must be powerful. And it is, according to what we saw. So when it came their time to receive this instruction, and it was through Hawaiian 
people, the, as, as this report says, from among the retinue or the people who were associated with the leadership who were assigned to go out and who were supported by the kingdom to set up what we call today schools. So the, this was the beginning of that kind of education, that kind of schooling through literacy, through writing. Of course, um, oh, oh, I'm supposed to go back. Is this, the next, this is the next slide. This is the next one. I'm getting confused. Okay. Um, the start of Hawaiian literacy from 1822 on the first publication, the, the missionaries had set up a little um, printing press and they had this uh, picture here of the first uh, paper that was printed is the alphabet and uh, was the start of this, and I, I'm, I'm connecting it to Hawaiian medium education because it was at formal gathering sites. They would set up a temporary show, a building. They would have a teacher. They would have a lesson. And the report also says in 1888, they were not also only using, I mean, teaching the, the use of these letters and how they all work, fit together and work, but the producing of meaning, of course, and the content, two content areas were used in the meaning part. One was in mathematics and the other was in geography. So they began, as I said, to set up a content uh, subject areas in, through literacy, through the main object was to teach people to read and write. But to do that, they had to express it through meaning as well and the content area was math, simple mathematics and simple geography. And this is where the missionaries played a role in their printing press, in producing very basic, simple material. And you must remember this is all being conducted through the language. So this is the rich um, documentation, in, not intended for reclamation, but intended to spread the word of God. However, as our people began to understand the power of writing and what it brought to them, foreign concepts about lands they had never been to and never seen in geography or how this mathematics would work in simple combination of numbers and what that me meant in trading, for example, that was going on. This became very, very powerful, this whole concept of literacy, bringing the world to their shores on a piece of paper. And so, as I said earlier, the Hawaiian language revitalization uses this very powerful medium of education today to go back into our school system because in 1893, when we were overthrown by American business, uh, in uh, business interests, the whole education system in Hawaii was changed into English. Anyway, by 1890, I would say by the eight, late 1870s, uh, the movement, very, very familiar story throughout the world, into the power of, of uh, capitalism, uh, making money, developing sugar, a crop, to sell and get big bucks for it, and other kinds of uh, uh, economic um, development that was very foreign to our people, uh, had already become quite evident. And that the people who were doing this kind of capitalism involvement were English-speaking people. Uh, and the, therefore, this great story that spreads throughout the world about how to get ahead in life, how to get a good job, is to go into, well, for our case, and I don't know, here in the Philippines as well, and many other countries, English is that language. In other countries, it could be Mandarin, Chinese, or whatever we have. 
So in our case, it's uh, English. And the missionaries set up their own private school because they didn't want their own children to be, I'll just say, contaminated by native schools or native-speaking children. They wanted to maintain their children as English-speaking children, so they established that school that our former President Obama attended, which is Punahou, which still exists as a private institute. And other private institutions were set up uh, during that time as well. But before Punahou, there was the Hawaiian school, Lahaina Luna, which was really more like a college, and only select uh, males were selected to be educated during the kingdom to become, uh, to take charge of various agencies throughout the, the government of the kingdom of Hawaii. Uh, and eventually, of, and of course by then, the Department of Instruction, as it was called, was already set up in 1841. And it was, as I said, uh, conducted through the medium of Hawaiian. And as it got into the late 1870s, it began, parents began to say, I want my children to go into the English school. I want my children to make money. I want them to get ahead. Uh, and that, by the time 1893 occurred, um, there were less than maybe 20 schools throughout the islands that were still being maintained in Hawaiian. So the writing was on the wall that uh, the medium of Hawaiian language was going to be changed. So by the time 1898 came around, the Republic of Hawaii, the, the formal taking over of the kingdom, and the Department of Instructions uh, now made it very formal that we can no longer use Hawaiian as a medium of instruction. So that had to be changed when we got involved, as I have at the bottom here, the start of the Hawaiian medium, Punana Leo program in 18, uh, 1983, and that initiated this journey of Hawaiian language revitalization. And uh, when we uh, started that uh, program, it was for our infant toddlers from two and a half years old who wanted to get to the new, to renew and uh, regenerate uh, Hawaiian language and bring it back into the homes, not at in the school because the preschools is a school, but we couldn't enter into a home. The most quick and convenient way was to set up a place to have children come to us and conduct uh, one hundred percent immersive uh, experience in the language and the philosophy of Hawaiian culture, the Hawaiian uh, perspective. That is a major challenge as well, but with our language, we are constantly uh, reminded to be uh, true to who we are and connect us to that identity. So, uh, as we opened our first schools, and we, when I say we, I'll repeat this later, but this is a bunch of about five or six people. Uh, we had no authority. We, uh, we, until today, we don't have any commission or anything like that. Uh, but uh, we were, uh, some of us were professors at the university. Hawaiian was taught at the University of Hawaii since 1921 as a subject, like you would take French, German, or Spanish as a foreign language. And then later, it changed uh, uh, because we objected to the term foreign language. And now, the university system calls it a second language requirement. So they don't use the term foreign language anymore. Um, and that helps not only Hawaiians, but I think other, other people. So. Um, the instruction uh, at the university level started in uh, 1919, I mean, in 1919, the university was established as an agricultural college. And then they wanted to get into arts and sciences. And in arts and sciences curriculum, you have language. And the territorial government at that time still consisted of many uh, members who were part of the kingdom, uh, parliament, or legislature. And they were wondering why Hawaiian was not one of the languages that would be offered at their, uh, 
at that time, College of uh, Agriculture going into the College of Arts and Sciences. So this is how Hawaiian became established way back in 1921 as a subject to be taught. And I did a paper on that, uh, on that subject on uh, the early teachers, their qualifications, the material they used, and basically it was a, it was a uh, taught mostly by Hawaiian ministers. Uh, the first teacher was actually a uh, MD, he was a doctor, but they were all native speakers, but never encountered teaching it at so-called college or university level. Uh, the course appeared to be quite simple. Uh, lots of uh, athletes took the course to get credit. Uh, and so it really wasn't taught seriously until maybe mm, late 60s maybe, or maybe a little bit earlier. The Hawaiian Dictionary came out in 1957. Uh, maybe after that, uh, it began. Dr. Albert, who had been hired as a linguist at the University of Hawaii, was quite influential in exploring. I was a student of his, but when I was a student at the university back in the 60s, um, it was taught as a more like a translation class. We have all of this documentation from the history of our kingdom, all kinds of documentation not only uh, court cases, not only land deeds, because uh, Hawaii went into fee simple with the great Mahele in 18, uh, was it 1848 or so. Uh, all these records, uh, all kinds of records, and the best records, of course, would have been our cheap publication, which is the Hawaiian language newspapers. Hawaiian language newspapers were very unique because they were not um, uh, news. Uh, only the people, our, our populace decided we need to write all of these uh, cultural uh, topics, information, our, our classic stories, our uh, medical, our fishing, our agriculture, uh, uh, sending in our lamentations because somebody had passed away and this is our way of expressing our grief, these chants and uh, songs were all sent into the newspapers over 100 years of publication. So at the time I was a student, they would take these stories that had been then collected by some people, put into little collections of books, and conveniently made available for us to use for translation into English. It was not really focusing on conversational use of Hawaiian, very kind of an academic university course. Um, so maybe after 60s, 70s, we started to move into this area. I don't know if you folks maybe know that um, we uh, became a state in 59. So in 69, 10 years following statehood, there was a great kind of an awakening on Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiian things. What about the Hawaiian culture? What about the um, the dance, the, we were not really using those cultural, um, the traditional dance to learn the way it's supposed to be danced in the traditional style. Tourism, the, the uh, industry of tourism had already started from the early, 19, before 1900, in 1888 I believe, whatever that date was at the World's Fair in Paris, France, they had sent, King had sent over a delegation of Hawaiian people set up in a beautiful exhibit, their feather cloaks and dancing and, and that. So the world became very familiar with Hawaii as a destination, fascinating place to go to. The tourist industry started early. So Hawaiian um, Renaissance brought a reawakening to language as well. So in 19, the early 1970s, the enrollment increased over 300% uh, in the enrollment in basic Hawaiian language classes. And this has been very significant because this is where today we rely on the 
quality of the education at that level in order to have fluent second language speakers because we do not have, and even if we had native speakers, I think we heard some comments earlier from our presenters, not all native speakers can be good teachers. They can be good um, providers of information where we could document certain practices, certain knowledge, language use, etc. but to be in a situation a formal uh, institution of learning called schools, not all native speakers are born teachers. You, you have to be trained. Uh, and anyway, this is the story of Hawaiian uh, medium education. So I'm gonna play a short video here where we're using this system called uh, Hakalama uh, and it was in, taken from the early days of teaching the simple, our, our alphabet is 13 letters. We have a glottal sound. We use the glottal stop. And we have five vowels, R, A, E, O, U, and seven, uh, eight consonants. So the way that these teachers who are sent out by the chiefs are allied to different places throughout the islands, I, they developed this because as I was interviewing some of our older people, they would say, my grandmother or grandfather would sit me down and he'd say, and they started to, to do this um, chanting of, or reciting, not just reciting it boringly, but a little bit of a melody, a chant to it, so they could get through this whole alphabet. And that is the system that we're using today, and it works beautifully and this is our um, how do we say Hawaiian uh, advantage because our language had was uh, uh, was created the orthography the writing was created at a time where it was based on the sound of the language these symbols represented these sounds not like in English being influenced by French and Latin and Greek and very difficult to read and write. But because we have this advantage in Hawaiian, we were taking advantage of it so that our children can become literate two years. In other words, if they're becoming to, I mean, learning how to read and write at four years old, that's about two years. Uh, an English speaking child would take about kindergarten or first grade to become beginning to become literate, beginning to be able to read and understand and write. So we have this advantage in Hawaii and we're taking full use of that advantage. Here's a short video of that, what's happening today in, in, uh, in our preschools called Punanaleo. And philosophy versus fish. I mean, all the different ways you can spell F, the F, Sound. So English has such a complex spelling system that children have to memorize the spelling of each word. In addition to the Hakalama syllabary itself, I think few people realize in Hawaii that when the missionaries came, they didn't really do a lot of teaching themselves. They developed the alphabet and they worked with the ali'i a little bit, but they really couldn't speak Hawaiian that well. So the Ali'i started these kind of halau-like schools out in the country. And so what do they do in the halau? They chant. And the thing they could chant is these single-syllable words. And so I, I believe that's how it happened. O kahana ana i na kuhi lima ka malama ana i kela ano la vena ke mele he mea hawai'i a avili i a kela mo mea ma ka mea ho kahi. Ke kahi manawa a a ale no pana pana na kiki ma ka Kapana kupano, eia no na e a o ia i hele a maa ha a pelala ko e a o e mau ka ho o lohe vale no. O ia ke kahi ka hua hoa ku o ka helu helu ka kona keiki i ke ana kuhi kuhi ke kumu mai ke kahi ao ao aku ai ke kahi ao ao mai ka hema ai ka akau. Ho i hou i ke kahi ao ao hema a kau mai luna a i lalo a pelakako e helu helu ai hema i ka a kau mai luna a i lalo 
a lilo kela mau kanana vale kona mau makau maka lilo kela he kahua. All children go through certain stages in their psychological development, cognitive development. All children can divide up language into words by age two. They can divide them up by syllables by age four. And they can divide them up by individual sounds or phonemes by age six. So if you're going to read by individual sounds, you're not going to be able to have the child learn to read until they're six at the very earliest. Really read. But if by syllables, such as the hakalama, you can have children reading by age four. No matter what language you learn to read in, you can transfer the skill of reading into another language, especially if it uses the same alphabet, like English and Hawaiian. The trick to reading is understanding the concept that these marks on paper represent words and thoughts that's a very deep concept. But once they get it and they understand, all I have to do is figure out this puzzle, how it fits together to language, they're able to transfer it into any other language that they know. The Hakalama is something Hawaiian that was somehow created by those kupuna and the ones before them and was used in Hawaiian families. And it produced some really good academic results. And just for historical purposes, to have it as part of the curriculum is important. But it's really great. It's an academically successful thing that is a true benefit that the Punana Leo keeps on moving forward. They keep on figuring out new ways to teach it and train teachers. So I'm really, really happy that we have it. Pili pui ke kale ike no kamea elike me ko kako mau kupuna ike lako ika ike ho lomi lomi ia ho ohana ia au ano ho ohavai ia ma ke ano he kupono au oia pu kaka ko hana mana puna na leo apa i kupono no ko kako nu ukia i puka la nakila. All right, so, okay, that's the um, uh, progress that has been made over 35 years in 1983 till present, and so we have, since 1994, the uh, first uh, high school graduation in Hawaiian immersion was 1999, and since 1999 to current times, we continue to graduate uh, high school students who are being educated entirely in the medium of the Hawaiian language. Okay, so, and that means, of course, the question is, uh, what are some things that Hawaiian Immersion or any school would require? Uh, being that it is in Hawaiian, naturally, everything would be in Hawaiian language. So naturally, uh, we have to train teachers. As you saw some of our teachers in that short video, um, they are second language, but they learn the language at good teaching at a university. And I'd like to brag about our College of Hawaiian Language. I think we have an excellent uh, approach to making our students fluent. Four years is a typical time a student goes to earn a bachelor's degree. We have a bachelor's. We never had degrees in Hawaiian before. The first bachelor's was started in 1982. And then we progressed and have now a graduate program master's program that you can earn a master's in Hawaiian language and a PhD program also in Hawaiian language, Hawaiian and indigenous uh, uh, language and culture. So I was just talking to Brendan there. We have a colleague from his uh, country, from Wisconsin actually, who's now a current uh, candidate in our doctorate program uh, for uh, Hawaiian and indigenous language and culture revitalization. And this is all grounded on our experience over these years, uh, 35 years of Hawaiian medium education. So we're jumping right into something that works for us. And um, that is the institution called school. So from the preschool in 1985, uh, 86, 87 was our first graduating class, a little children. 
and our parents and teachers and our few families were the impetus at the state legislature that said we, our children deserve and need to continue in Hawaiian language medium education. And by that time, we were very fortunate that our two years in, because little children grow up very quickly from two and a half to five, moving into kindergarten, first grade, was successful. That we could show, because we had to go to the state legislature to testify against this bill, I mean this law that had been passed in the Republic banning the use of a wine medium. And that affected um, not only the continuation of using Hawaiian as a medium, of course, in our public schools, but also to certify our teachers. And at that time, we wanted our children to be in contact with native speakers. We knew they won't be, uh, weren't going to be around for long. And we needed to have an exception for those kinds of teachers who are native speakers to come in contact with our children from 7 in the morning to 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, five days a week, and our parents as well. And then the parents, of course, affected their families and the community. So when we first started, at, we had two sites, the Hilo site and one in Honolulu, where I was uh, there at the time starting that school. We only started with seven children because families naturally are going to say, what are you going to do with our child? Going, you're reversing, going back to the Stone Age in Hawaiian language. And we had to convince them we're not going back to the Stone Age. We're moving forward with our Hawaiian language. And as we were testifying at the state legislature, we took our children, our staff, our curriculum, our, in, our mission, and they began to understand more. And it still is a process. It still is a process. It's brand new. United States of America is not accustomed to having a native language take charge of a child's education. I think we are doing a pretty good job, but we still have a far way to go. Uh, and so these are the kinds of things that documentation will come into play. You need to have qualified teachers. How do you build the curriculum up? How do they become fluent? in algebra, in any school topic that needs to be conducted through the language. Authentication, of course, we're always constantly concerned about the standard of our language, and thank goodness we have many forms of documentation. Video is more recent, of course. We have film, very little of that, but we have lots of uh, audio recording, and of course, lots and lots of written material. And uh, textbooks for teaching, of course, we rely on that uh, documentation tremendously to develop our teaching grammar books, textbooks, or books that we use in our schools. And we have a Hawaiian language center that we started in 18, uh, 1989 to support that um, Hawaiian medium program. So the Hawaiian education excuse me, the Hawaiian um, uh, Language Center, Halikuomo, is also the center that now, since 2001, established a teaching, uh, teacher licensing program for Hawaiian immersion. So it's a whole process. You, know, you have to start uh, since, uh, as I said, the first Punana Leo graduate little children entering into public school was 1987. And from 1987, we have survived until today, and we intend to be there forever. Uh, and then we have learning and cultural content taught through language, of course, that's very important. I mentioned to you how our people were very concerned. They thought about documenting um, chants, stories, uh, classical stories that fill like 500 pages of a book, one story. They, they were just prolific in publishing. As I said, cheap publishing, newspaper print. Today we have that all online. And then, of course, our awareness of other languages. I think uh, Dr. Wilson Pilos mentioned um, the uh, Japanese uh, uh, kanji, uh, uh, 
writing, the Japanese alphabets. So we are teaching Japanese writing to our students at the school from kindergarten. They're beginning to learn those, uh, and they think of it as a game. They think of it as fun. So by the time they get to fourth and fifth grade, they learn 45 characters. They're spelling Hawaiian through a different orthography because they can pronounce Hawaiian using that, those symbols. Uh, it, it is a connection to not only, because I'm part Japanese, but there are lots of Japanese. And we also are teaching Chinese, Mandarin. The, the teacher we have uh, teaches Mandarin. We'd like to have Cantonese, but we can't. We haven't gotten to Filipino. Uh, we're also teaching Latin. Our children in Hawaiian immersion or any immersion program, our language immersion, have that kind of awareness and advantage in picking up language, languages, and also different understandings of uh, different cultures through that language uh, lens. So this is something that we take advantage of while we have that kind of education. Um, connecting, of course, we like to do outdoor and indoor things. You all heard about our uh, voyaging canoe that happened. Those kinds of things help a lot to get our people interested again back in our culture. Um, of course, there are other kinds of requirements, parent involvement, place for school funding, evaluation, accreditation is a big issue right now because the way you evaluate uh, 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 Hawaiian uh, perspective on education, the kinds of content, the way our language works is not the same as English language, linguistically English is not the same as Hawaiian, although they're both languages. Uh, spelling is quite simple in, in Hawaiian, whereas it's very difficult in, in, in English. Uh, that, that's one area that they're evaluated on is language arts, and the other would be math and science. And there are different ways of understanding math and science to our language. Anyway, that's a topic. And so I had mentioned earlier that we came up with our own philosophy of Hawaiian education and written it, documented it in 1996-97. It's called the Kumuhonua Mauliola. Anyway, let, now, can I, do you have, yeah, can we go to the next slide? Uh, I'm trying to hurry because I see my time is almost up. So, what is that? Just, if you could just move the next slide. And uh, I think the next slide, I don't have it. That when I see it, I know. It's about, uh, oh, our websites, I believe. So our websites are, our, our documentation, of course, today is preserved. The best way of preserving all of these things, I believe, of course, they're making it accessible, is to put it into a digitized form so it could be put online organize and make it available. Thank goodness for lots of our local institutions in the state of Hawaii. We have uh, Bishop Museum, for example. They may have some documentation that they're working on making it more available. We have the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Uh, they have made many um, sources of Hawaiian language uh, material available through their website. We have, of course, the Hawaiian Mission Houses, which is really a, a, a legacy of the missionary history in, his, in Hawaii, and they have set up an archival, um, digital archive available to the public. We have our own college, the Ulukau website, that has posted all textbooks, uh, new development, new uh, you know, curriculum material that's been printed to our Hawaiian Language Center that's available on that website. So I'm just emphasizing that we have material. We're using, of course, this main uh, uh, medium right now of technology to make that available and also to preserve it, especially to preserve it for the future. And um, I'd like to just say that, um, if I didn't say earlier, our slides coming up, okay, um, that, uh, you know, that little group of people that got together, there was a linguist, a linguist, maybe two linguists, there was an anthropologist kind of person. We were just friends. 
we are still friends, thank goodness. I mean, it's hard to still be friends, you know, when you have to work on all of this kind of stuff. You all know that. Um, yeah, so we're colleagues because we're still teaching, especially, and we have to coordinate between high, higher education all the way down to the babies. At, and we even have infant toddler now. We're taking them at nine months old. We, we used to take them at six weeks. It was kind of expensive because taking care of small babies require more personnel. But this is how we're affecting our families so that um, 30 years ago, that child that was in our Punana Leo, of course, right now, would be a par our parents. And therefore, their parent is now their parents, are now grandparents. And that family, three generations, are speaking Hawaiian at home. And they have this opportunity to send their children to education through the medium of Hawaiian that is continually being worked on so that we can survive and make it known to our country for now. We have to start with our little place in the United States that we can do this. It's not any language can be used to educate a people. And the ramifications, as we've been hearing from different presenters, is, is outside of just having us use our language, make it live, is just tremendous. Just tremendous. And this is where I'm, we're all looking forward to that kind of um, evaluations or assessment on the well-being of a people and how we can save our government millions and billions of dollars maybe or whatever. We have those kinds of statistics among our own Hawaiian people. So I don't have to go there. And um, that's some of our websites that I told you earlier. And then here's another slide I think of our, of our uh, mighty, um, oh, yeah, yeah, and some more, um, some more questions. Oh, we can't, I don't think we can go into all the home pages. I'd love to take you to some of these items. This is the Hawaiian mission, uh, the missionary um, legacy that they left in Hawaii. They kept letters and possibly one of the earliest writings were by our leaders, Ali'i Ka'ahumanu and those. They had written notes and letters in their hand. Beautiful penmanship too that occurred through this uh, writing. Uh, learning and other websites that our staff here has and uh, maybe we'll just end with that last slide of us mighty heroes back in I think that photo was taken in the 1980s and as I said that's the kind just a batch of people we had no authority we had we, uh, and as we've been hearing from our presenters starting from the ground up so I see that some of you I mean here that you're doing that is wonderful. And it's not, it's not easy, but uh, we have to begin that way. And we have to believe in who we are as very, very positive, positive. And we have to show that we can be successful. That's the proof in the pudding, so to speak. And anyway, that's, I don't have enough time to go through these other um, uh, what do you call documentations or dictionaries? And we also are very active in uh, doing a new words dictionary, Mamaka uh, Kayao, because as you get into this current world and the knowledge of and thoughts and new ideas that are being developed, just can't keep up with the amount of information. We need to to say in these things and interact with these things in our own language. So we do have a lexicon committee and we're just bombarded. We cannot um, keep up with the words, but the main thing is we have to tr keep, keep our language up with new concepts and new developments because we're gonna have our children live for today and tomorrow in their language. And then, of course, yeah, one more slide and then think. Yeah, those are the guys over there, some of us. And as I said, these are linguists, activists, educators, parents, anthropologists, friends, native speakers, colleagues, hopefully, we're, and we're still our friends. And I think, can I do the, a little bit of, uh, the, of a video that's called Change Agents? And so we'll see that as our ending 
for this um, presentation. Thank you very much. Before you even walk in the door, you can hear how special this place is. It's not only that these keiki are growing up learning and speaking their language that makes these schools so special, but it's the way that they come to view and interact with the world around them. The life lessons that these keiki learn, whether it's awamukuleana, or stepping up and taking responsibility, launa amalama kanaka, knowing how to greet and interact with all kinds of people, even the constant lavena checks are guidance on how to carry themselves. And I think being comfortable in the aume ume or the struggle necessary to succeed, those kind of ha'avina are the ones that ground future leaders. It's also the way that these ha'avina are imparted through our Olala Hawaii in these spaces and by people who embrace this older way of thinking. I think it's that way that's encoded in our olalo that really has an impact on who we become and who we are as individuals. Eva came to us almost right out of high school, so it wasn't necessarily her experience or her expertise per se that we hired her for, but her work ethic, her respect, not only for authority, but for what we're trying to accomplish as a business, and her ability to fight through the struggle of learning new things and really wanting to nail it. Those kind of characteristics in an employee are priceless. She's since completed her BA in journalism and a master's in organizational leadership. So these graduates like Eva aren't just well versed in things Hawaiian, but they're well educated and they're good at their craft. So they're pushing the envelope regardless of what language they're doing it in. But the beauty of it is they can do it in Hawaiian. Mahope o ke kana kolua oi makahiki o ke kokua makaho o kele ana i ke kahi o na o kahi ho ola o lelo o iwi i kaikaloa apuni koho nua. It's been such a wonderful experience. It's a great melding of my skills, my passions, and the people I've met, the places I've seen, and the exposure I've gotten. Eya no ma kone o oiwi TV ma Whitvik e lua kau kani umi kumalua. Ua po mai ka iloa. A i ke lea wau ma muli ke la o ka uhana i ia ma ka papahana me ka paa o ka olalo Hawaii o ia ka uka hua. I hua ka i olu olu lea lea a pale kana ke kahi a ho i hou aku oe i kou ai na aloha. Ua ana hana oli, hana ka poe a. A unique identity that I get from Hawaiian being my first language and the language that I was schooled in and raised in, it makes me feel very comfortable with who I am and I could go anywhere. I could live anywhere in the world and feel comfortable with who I am and succeed in everything that I do. I think the biggest misconception that we have is that students that learn in a Hawaiian medium environment won't be able to live in the English speaking world. Should we schedule something afterwards to talk about the tourism conference? It's a complete misconception. People will be able to see that's not true, especially now that we have so many graduates you know, going to college, working in so many different fields of employment and doing really well and succeeding. We've had some wonderful opportunities come our way, like Ohana by Hawaiian Air. It's pretty much a feather in your cap to be able to you know, design a plane. I feel really lucky to be working even around a program like this. It's really something, it's really incredible what's going on. Kahi, luab. There's just this level of self-value. You're starting from a position of strength, you're enhancing that position of strength, and that's the place where you can go out and become better at anything. Well, that's the place where you can go excel in medical school because you know that you can handle something. You know where you're starting at. We have to put ourselves into these positions and we also have to turn around and help people get here.
With that kind of mindset and perspective on their kuleana to contribute back to a broader community, to me, it's obvious how they're all going to effectuate positive change. And it's only just begun because every single year, more and more ohana, many of them leaders themselves, are becoming a part of this papahana. My younger brother was in the first class at Kula Kayapuni. He started as a second grader. And then my youngest brother started two years later. And so when we had our KQ, we always knew we were going to send them into some sort of immersion program. <laughs> that I graduated from the William S. Richardson School of Law. I got a certificate in Native Hawaiian Law. And I just think having the perspective of what Hawaiians are going through and having an understanding of that whole spectrum, you know, where we've been, where we are now, and where we hope to go. I think that's why it's important to have that grounding. The sooner you can get it, I think the easier it's going to be for them to understand the context behind things as we go on. As Dr. Kimura reminded us, the task of language revitalization should involve the cooperation of different sectors in society. Uh, mahalo, thank you very much, Dr. Kimura. Uh, your aloha aina. Our love for the land of Hawaii is really inspiring and also it manifests in your love and passion for the Hawaiian language. Maraming salamat po. Dr. Kumura, palakpakan po natin muli. At tayo po ngayon ay magkakaroon ng labing limang minutong merienda, break para sa ating merienda. Muli, we will be having a 15-minute break. Uh, Naasahan po ang lahat na magbalik po dito sa ating bulwagan matapos ang labing limang minuto. Salamat po.